Hey, everybody. All right. Sorry for the late start. Was having some technical difficulties, but we are going to jump right into it. Thank you all for joining in today. Uh, we're going to be talking about contract for deed and wholesaling. Okay. So uh, we're going to be doing two topics today. I'm going to try to roll them into to one session. So hopefully you guys can stick with me. Um, and if you guys want to blame anybody, uh, blame Sammy, because she wanted to know about contract for deed and uh, for uh, wholesaling. So I'm going to try to mush them in together. So there's going to be two PowerPoints. All right. Uh, so stick with me here. Uh, if you guys have questions, um, I would say write them down or you can put them into the chat box um, and uh, I will try to get to them. OK, at the end. But since we have a few uh, since we have a lot of information to get through, uh, I'm going to try to make it as quick as possible. OK, so I am going to share my screen here. Give me one second. OK. All right. So hopefully everybody can see the screen here. So the first topic that we are going to be talking about is contract for deed. OK. So I'm pretty sure most of you guys are in the real estate industry and you guys have heard of contract for deed, uh, but I'm willing to bet that some of you guys have never done contract for deed before, okay? Or you guys don't even know anybody that's ever done a contract for deed, okay? Some of you guys will, a lot of you guys won't, okay? And you gals, okay? But today I wanna just give you a little bit more information about what contract for deed is. Uh, and we're going to be talking about your role. So I'm, I'm going to be coming at this from a real estate agent and real estate investor standpoint. OK, uh, so just for you, just for your information of how I'm going to be talking about this. All right. So what is contract for deed? OK, so contract for deed, also known as a land contract or installment sale, is a real estate transaction where the seller finance finances the purchase directly with the buyer, okay? So unlike a traditional mortgage seller, uh, the seller, aka the, uh, the grantor, retains legal title to the property until the buyer, the grantee, completes the payment terms outlined in the contract. So this is going to go back to kind of your uh, real estate license training. So I know that some agents are joining us from across the country, okay? So, you know, the terms might be a little bit different from state to state, but generally uh, the uh, um, the concept is going to be the same. OK, uh, but going back to the contract for deed piece and what it is. So really what it is, is it's where the seller is the bank. OK, since the buyer usually can't get uh, uh, financing and that's really what it's for is usually when the buyer is not able to get financing. Uh, maybe it's because the buyer's uh, financial situation or maybe it's the type of property, okay? Whatever it is, the seller is saying, okay, I will be the bank for you as the buyer, okay? So that way the buyer doesn't have to go to a bank or a lender or whatnot to get a loan. The seller is gonna sell the property and is gonna be the lender, okay? Uh, but the seller is going to hold the title to the property, okay? So hence the name contract for a deed, okay? So the title stays in the name of the seller, the grantor, okay? And the uh, equitable title goes to the buyer or the grantee, okay? So again, going back to your, your real estate licensing class, legal title and equitable title, the seller, the guarantor holds the legal title okay the buyer the grantee holds the equitable title okay Oops. Yeah. all right so the mechanics of a cd okay uh what 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 is a cd and how does it work right so the seller and the buyer negotiate the terms of the contract including the purchase price the down payment interest rate payment schedule and duration of the contract. So remember when I said that the seller is the one, the seller and the buyer, uh, the seller is the, the, the lender, okay? The seller is the bank, okay? So the terms between the buyer and the seller are negotiable, okay? 
like with most traditional lenders, when you're helping, you know, a buy, if you're a real estate agent and you're helping a buyer, they go get pre-approved with lender. The lender is going to be like, okay, this is the down payment, right? 3%, 3.5%, 5%. These are all the fees, blah, blah, blah. Usually the buyer can't negotiate those, okay? But in a contract for deed, the buyer can negotiate those, all right? Because they're negotiating it directly with the seller, okay? Now, how open the seller is to negotiating, that's really depending on the seller, okay? But you as the agent, if you're representing the, the seller or the buyer, that's going to be your job is to negotiate the terms of the contract for deed, okay? So the purchase price, obviously, that's going to be, uh, you know, one of the, the negotiating pieces, the down payment, okay? So it could be zero down, okay? It doesn't, there doesn't even have to be a down payment. Um, but if the buyer and the seller come to whatever agreement on the down payment, that's what it's going to be, okay? Interest rates. So it, there's generally going to be an interest rate. There doesn't have to be, but there usually is, okay? Because again, the seller is acting as the bank. So the seller is probably going to want some kind of interest rate. Generally, it's going to be around similar to the uh, whatever the mortgage interest rate is, or maybe a little bit higher. Okay, uh, but if you are an expert negotiator and you're say you're working for the buyer as an agent, you're an expert negotiator, uh, then you can probably get that interest rate down. Okay, uh, payment schedule. Okay, so a payment schedule sometimes is called a amortization. Okay, so amortization uh, for you guys that don't know what that is is how long are the payments going to be based off of? Okay. So generally in a regular conventional loan, the amortization is 30 years. Okay. So the monthly payments are based off of 30 years. Okay. For me, I usually try to do the same thing. If, if I'm helping a client or if I am buying a property on a contract for deed, I want my, uh, I want my uh, buyers or me to pay an amortization based off of 30 years, okay? Now, if I'm the seller, maybe I want a shorter amortization, like 25 years or something, okay? Uh, so the payment schedule, that will be uh, negotiated as well, okay? And the duration of the contract, okay? So how long is the contract? Again, the duration of the contract is different from the amortization. Just because it's amortized for 30 years doesn't mean the contract has to be for 30 years, okay? The contract could be for like nine years. So we would call that a balloon payment, okay? So the payment is based off of 30 years, but the balloon payment when the loan is due, okay, or when the contract is due is in nine years, okay? So so they're going to be paying their monthly payments based off of 30 years. But when the nine month, uh, the, the nine year, okay, the nine year balloon payment comes due, that's when they have to pay it all off. Okay. And it doesn't have to be nine years. I just use that as an arbitrary number. It could be one year, two year, three year, 15 years. Okay. Just know that at the end of that time frame, that's when the entire balance has to be paid off. Okay. Once both parties agree, uh, they sign a contract outlining the terms. That's the actual contract for deed is what they sign, okay? Now, don't get that mistaken, especially, again, for us. A lot of us are real estate agents, okay? The purchase agreement, which you, the real estate agent, is going to help negotiate, you know, that's going to have the purchase price, down payment, interest rate, payment schedule, duration of the contract on there. But I want to make it clear, okay? Okay. The purchase agreement is not the contract for deed, okay? So that's one thing that a lot of agents do not understand is the purchase agreement or the offer to purchase or whatever you call it in your state, the sale agreement is not the contract for deed, okay? The contract for deed is totally separate. Think of the actual contract for deed as like the mortgage documents, right? So you have your purchase in a regular transaction, you have your purchase agreement, and then you have your mortgage and your deed, okay? So in a contract for deed, it's a similar thing. You have your purchase agreement and then you have your contract for deed, okay? So those are two separate things. Just understand that they're two separate things, okay? Uh, and again, I just want to drill that into you guys because a lot of agents, they're like, oh, well, you know, we, we got the purchase agreement done. So that's the contract for deed, right? Wrong, okay? Okay. You still need an actual contract for deed. And generally, that contract for deed is going to be written up by a uh, an attorney, okay, a lawyer, or I suggest it to be written up by an attorney, okay? So you as the agent, unless you know how to write contract for deeds, unless you're an agent, unless your brokerage already has those documents for you, I would not write the contract for deed yourself if you are a real estate agent, okay?
have an attorney do it. Now, there's going to be a separate cost for that, uh, but have the attorney write the contract, okay? Because, yeah, us agents, we don't have that contract, okay? Um, the buyer takes possession of the property and makes regular payments to the seller, which typically typically includes a principal and interest. So again, just like with a regular loan, when the buyer gets the keys at the closing, okay, it's going to be a normal closing, close at the title company, same thing, okay? The title company is going to record the, the contract for deed and everything. So all of that is the same, okay? But every month, the buyer is going to make regular payments to the seller, just as if they're making your mortgage payments, okay? And it's probably going to include principal and interest, okay? And then maybe taxes and insurance, uh, if that is all uh, negotiated into there, okay? So they just make their payments normally and make sure that they uh, uh, make the payments according to what it's stated in the contract, okay? Okay, some legal considerations when doing contract for deed, okay? So... While the buyer has equitable rights to the property, legal title remains uh, in the seller's name or with the seller until the contract terms are fulfilled. So legally, that property is still owned by the seller, okay? The buyer just has equitable rights to the property. So what does all that mean, right? If you forgot everything after, after your course one uh, of your real estate license and you you're just like, okay, I passed the test. I'm just going to dump all the equitable rights, legal rights, all that stuff. So equitable rights means that, that if there is any equity that's built up in the property, the buyer has rights to that. Okay. That's the equitable rights part. The legal rights part is who actually owns the property. Okay. So owning the property and owning the equity can be separated. All right. So in this situation, it is. Okay. So the buyer owns the equitable title. The seller owns the legal title, okay? So, you know, that's just something to think about. The seller can do some shady stuff if they want to, but hopefully the contract for deed uh, has listed everything out in the contract. And that's the reason why I suggest it to be written by an attorney, okay? So that way both sides can have some sort of protection within the contract, okay? I know, kind of confusing, but that's what it is, okay? If the buyer defaults on payments, the seller may have the right to terminate the contract and regain possession of the property. So again, equate that to kind of like a regular loan, right? If the buyer doesn't make the payments on their regular loan, the bank can foreclose and take the property back. Same thing in a contract for a deed, okay? It's just, it's just not a foreclosure. It's just, it's just a different process, okay? If the buyer doesn't make those promised payments, okay, the seller has the right to take the property back, okay? However, the specifics of the contract enforcement vary by jurisdiction and terms outlined in the agreement. So again, like what I said earlier, uh, it might not be a foreclosure, okay? Most contract for deeds are not, you know, when, when the seller has to take the property back, it's usually not through a foreclosure, okay? It's a more simple process. Uh, but every jurisdiction will be a little bit in how they hand a little bit different in how they handle it. Okay. So what's in it for the buyer? Okay. So for contract for deed, all right, uh, it offers an alternative financing option for buyers who may have difficulty qualifying for traditional mortgages. Okay. Uh, they might have poor credit. They might not have a good down payment. Okay or whatever other financial situation they have, okay? So it's good for people that don't really, you know, don't fit the, the criteria of like a, a reg, getting a regular conventional loan. You know, when I say conventional, I mean like all types of those regular loans, like FHA, VA, conventional. If you're not within those categories, then contract for deed might be a good option, okay? Uh, it allows the buyers to build equity in the property over time while they work towards getting uh, conventional financing. Okay. So, you know, in a situation where let's say the buyer has very bad credit, right. Or they have no credit, they can't get a loan anywhere. Right. Then they might be able to do a contract for deed. And so buying, getting a contract for deed property allows them to start building that equity. Because again, remember they're making those monthly payments and as they're making those monthly payments, hopefully the property is increasing in value. So they're building equity. Okay. 
and they're building that equity while they work on their their uh, credit. Okay, so when they get their credit up at the end of the contract term, they can refinance it. Okay, or they can refinance it sooner. So that would be a scenario uh, where they can use contract for deep. Okay, uh, the buyer may also avoid some of the closing costs associated with a traditional mortgage. So again, with traditional mortgages, there's going to be all these different closing costs, appraisals, um, you know, points, uh, you know, all these different fees that come with it. Uh, in a contract for deed, the buyer can probably negotiate away some of that, that stuff, right? Like an appraisal. So you could probably, you know, probably don't even need an appraisal if you do a contract for deed. Now, can you do an appraisal? Yes, you can. But I'm just using it as an example of something that you can probably negotiate away from the buyer side, okay? So what's in it for the sellers, right? Sellers can attract a wire pool of potential buyers by offering flexible financing options. So let's just say like when interest rates are sky high, like where they're for, right? We saw, I started to see some contract for deeds pop up here and there. They were uh, really more popular when the market crashed back in uh, um, 2008, 2009, 2010, because, you know, people, it was hard for people to get financing, okay? And a lot of people's financing kind of went in the toilet, okay? Uh, because, you know, they were going through foreclosures and those kind of things. Um, so it's good if you're a seller and you're like, man, you know, uh, the a lot of the buyers that want to buy my properties can't, you know, get into my property because they can't get a regular loan. Maybe offering a contract for deed will allow you to get more potential buyers, in, okay? The seller may receive higher purchase price and generate ongoing income from interest payments, okay? So, you know, if you have a, if you're a seller on the, you know, we're looking through from the seller's eyes now, if you're a seller and you're like, hey, you know, this buyer, I will, I will sell it to this buyer, you know, uh, doing a contract for deed if they're willing to pay a higher purchase price, right? Uh, then, then I would do that. Okay. Uh, and I get to collect interest payments. All right. So say for example, now I'm putting my investor hat. If I was an investor and I was trying to sell one of my investment properties, uh, but maybe I didn't want to sell it right away because I maybe have some type of tax situation that I need to take care of. And I want to have time to prepare for, uh, the, the tax situation. I might sell my property on a contract for deed. So I, I can sell the property. I don't have to take care of it anymore. I still get income from it. But since it's an installment sale, I have time to figure out what to do with the capital gains, okay? So I might have whatever the contract term is, you know, two years, three years, nine years to figure out how I'm going to take care of those taxes, okay? So from an investor standpoint, that might be a, 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 a good, a good uh, situation, okay? Uh, in the event of a default, sellers can often reclaim the property more quickly and with fewer legal hurdles compared to a foreclosure process, okay? So remember what I said that generally in contract for deeds, when the buyer stops paying uh, or does something that, you know, they uh, uh, go default on the contract, usually the sellers don't have to go through a foreclosure. Again, it's it's dependent on the jurisdiction that you're in, Okay. But usually the sellers do not have to go through a foreclosure process, which is long and lengthy and very expensive. The sellers can usually get the property back very quickly, okay? So that's what's in it for the seller. So considerations for both parties, okay? So should so both parties should carefully review and understand the terms of the contract, okay? And again, the contract is not the purchase agreement, okay? Okay. Uh, including any provisions related to default, late payments, and property maintenance responsibilities. So both parties, the buyer and the seller, should read that contract and know what is required of them, what they need to do, their, their jobs, you know, in the contract for deed, okay? The buyer should conduct a thorough due diligence on the property, including inspection, title searches to identify any potential issues or encumbrances. And again, most of the times, contracts are tra contract for deeds will be closed to a title company, uh, so it's going to be the same. The, the process is going to be the same. Doing an inspection, uh, if they want to, that's going to be the same. Okay. The seller should assess the creditworthiness and financial stability of the potential buyers to mitigate risk of default. Okay. So from the seller standpoint, um, the seller should 
look into the uh, the finances of the buyers, just like the bank would do. Okay. Uh, do they do a really thorough one? I would say no. Probably the sellers are probably not going to do as a, a thorough underwriting of the buyer as like the bank or the lender would do. Uh, but if you were the seller, okay, if you were the seller's agent, you would, you know, I would suggest you do it, okay? Um, because, you know, you don't want to give, it's just like the bank doesn't want to give the loan to somebody that can't pay. You don't want to sell your house as contract for deed to somebody that can't pay because you're just going to have to end up taking it back again anyways, okay? So those are the considerations for both parties, right? Um, all right, conclusion, okay. So contract can contract for D can be a viable option for both buyers and sellers seeking alternative financing arrangements and real estate transactions. So again, it can be good for the buyer and the seller, okay? If if they fit within that within within the contract for D bubble, okay, or box, okay? So don't think that that if, if you're a real estate agent and let's just say you're helping a buyer, don't think, oh, you know, we can go offer contract for deed for for every house on the MLS, okay? I mean, you could, okay? But it probably won't work, okay? So it's it only works for a specific type of, of property, specific type of deal, okay? Again, think of contract for deed like just another, just another loan, right? Another different type of loan, just like conventional doesn't work for every type of property. FHA doesn't work for every type of property. VA doesn't work for every type of property. Same thing, contract for deed, just another type of financing doesn't work for every property. Okay. So just understand that. Okay. Uh, it's essential for both parties to fully understand their rights, obligation, and potential risks associated with this type of agreement. So again, the buyer and the seller should understand what the risks are in doing a contract for D. Okay. So you as the agent, uh, you, you know, if, if you are an agent, okay. You want to make sure that you are explaining the risks uh, of contract for deed um, to your clients. But again, you're not a lawyer, okay? So if a lawyer drafts up that contract, make sure the lawyer explains the contract to them, okay? Because legally, uh, the lawyer did it, so you can't talk on that, okay? And again, if you have questions, talk with your broker, okay, about what your duties are in the contract for deed, okay? Uh, same thing on the seller side. Uh, seller, it's exactly the same thing. Sellers should have their own representation um, helping them, okay? Um, and that's it. That's contract for deed, okay? So again, contract for deed, uh, it's not the same. The, the, the actual contract is not the same as the purchase agreement. It's good for people that can't get up, you know, the traditional types of financing. It's good for sellers if they want to have other options of selling their property, okay? And everybody's got to make sure that they understand what's going on in the contract for D, okay? So that was like a super very quick overview of contract for deed, okay? Uh, I'm going to open it up now. We're about halfway through. So I'm going to open it up now. If you guys have any questions uh, for the um, for the contract for deed, okay? I'm gonna look at the chat here, okay. First, can the seller have a mortgage loan, mortgage, or does the property have to be paid off, okay? So the, the, the seller can still have a mortgage on the property. Generally, this works best with properties that are not, uh, does not have any uh, loan on it, okay? But can it have a loan? Yes. So that would be considered what we call a wrap, right? Not R-A-P, W-R-A-P, a wrap, okay? So that would be a wrap around CD. <clears throat> so the contract, so you would have the the house and the seller would have their, 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 their loan that when they bought the property, they would have that, okay? The seller would have that mortgage, right? And the seller wants to sell it while they still have that mortgage, that is possible, okay? The contract for deed will wrap around the mortgage that's in place, okay? Now, how they set that up can be a little bit tricky because the money that the, they have to bring in from the buyer would have to be more than the money they're paying for the mortgage, okay? And <clears throat> both sides will have to figure out, okay, how will the mortgage be paid 
from the proceeds of the monthly payments from the buyer, okay? It can get a little confusing, uh, but it is possible, okay? But the best way to do it is with, with a property that's free and clear, okay? All right, what happens if the seller dies while the buyer is still making payment? Who has the rights to the title? So the 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 sellers uh the if the seller dies okay the property uh the property will pass to the seller's heirs okay or it would <laughs> it would go through probate okay so it would get very complicated when the seller dies but hopefully the contract the actual contract will states what happens uh when the if the seller dies uh and, and 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 how the estate is gonna handle it. But generally, if the seller dies, the seller's estate becomes the owner of the the title. Okay, uh, that's where having having a really good contract uh, is very important. Okay, especially if you're the buyer. Okay, you want to make sure if the seller dies that, that you're not gonna lose all the money that you've been paying into it. Okay, uh, there is a contract for deed form in the MLS. Should we be using that? Okay, so generally, uh, the contract for deed form in the so uh, the so I'm talking about the MLS here in Minnesota. Okay, everybody's MLS might be a little bit different, and the forms that you have might be a little bit different. Uh, from my understanding, the contract for deed forms in, in in our MLS in North Star MLS is just for the purchase only. Okay, they are not the actual contract. Okay, so and, and I think. Then this is Sammy's question. So Sammy, I think, you know, what you're thinking about is the contract for deed addendum. Okay. So that's just the addendum to the purchase agreement. Okay. So that's not the actual contract in the contract for deed. Okay. That will still have to be written up uh, by an attorney. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question. If, if working with an investor, how would the process typically work? For example, would the investor pay cash for the property and then proceed to execute a contract for deed with a new buyer? What additional fees would the buyer have to pay? So yes, okay. So if you're working with an investor, okay, and the investor wants to buy a property cash, okay? So if they buy the property cash and all the property is free and clear and belongs to the investor, yes, the investor can turn around and sell it on a contract for deed. That is possible, okay? So additional fees, the buyer would have to pay. So I'm assuming that you're talking about that end buyer that buys it, uh, contract for deed from the uh, from the investor. Uh, so those fees again would be negotiated between the uh, uh, the the buyer and the investor. Okay, um, you still will have your standard like closing cost fees and and agent fees and and all of that. But as far as the fees for the contract for deed from the investor and the end buyer. That's going to be negotiated uh, between those two parties. Okay. So hopefully that answered your question, Diego. Is there any other questions? If there is no other questions, I am going to move on to the wholesaling. Okay. So I'm going to bring it up really quick here. Bear with me here. All right, I'm going to share my screen here for the wholesaling, okay? All right, so wholesaling, okay? So I'm, I'm pretty sure most of us uh, understand or have heard of wholesaling, okay? Um, so I'm just going to kind of breeze through it a little bit. And again, same thing, if you have questions, uh, put it into the chat box or at the end, then you can unmute yourself and ask it, okay? But wholesaling, all right? So what is wholesaling? So uh, real estate wholesaling is a method of investing in real estate where wholesaler contracts with the seller to buy a property, then assigns that contract uh, to another buyer, okay? So the uh the the wholesaler okay so uh, i'm going to assume that the wholesaler is just a regular investor not an agent okay an agent can be a wholesaler as well okay um but let's just say they're just an investor that that is not an agent that doesn't have a license right 
And let's just say I'm the agent. I'm going to use an example. I, I am the, I'm the wholesaler. I'm the investor, right? And I approach a, a seller, okay? So I would say to the seller, say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, I see uh, that you have your, your property for sale here. I want to purchase your property, okay? And I will purchase your property for X amount. Let's just say $100,000. So me as the investor and the seller, we execute a purchase agreement or a sale contract or, o or OTP or whatever you call it in your in your state, okay? Uh, a sale agreement. We would execute a sale agreement saying that the seller would sell their property to me, okay? And then what I would do as the, as the investor, as the wholesaler, I would assign that contract, okay? The contract that we signed, I would assign it to the end buyer, okay? So I'm not selling the property. I'm selling the contract, okay? I'm assigning that contract to the end buyer, okay? That's kind of how the wholesaling works. All right. Oops. The wholesaler acts as an uh, intermediary between the seller and the end buyer, earning a profit through the assignment of the contract. So again, kind of like in my example, I'm getting it under contract for one price between me, the investor, and the uh, seller. And then I'm selling that contract, assigning the contract to the end buyer for a different price. And let's use, use that example again. My contract price with the original seller is 100000 right? And I turn right around to the uh, the end buyer and I say, hey, Mr. End Buyer, I have this property uh, and I want to sell it to you. I want to sell my, the contract to you uh, for one hundred and five thousand. Right. The buyer agrees. We we fill out an assignment form. OK, so I once we fill out the assignment form, I take that assignment form. I attach the purchase, the original purchase agreement with it. We send it over to the title company. OK. And then on the day of closing. The end buyer brings one hundred and five thousand to the closing. Okay, the title company gives one hundred thousand to the original seller as I promised them. Right, that extra five thousand dollar is mine as my assignment fee. Okay, that's how the wholesaler makes the money. Okay, so how it works. All right. The wholesaler identifies uh, distressed properties, negotiates a purchase contract, remember in my example, with the seller at below market price, or hopefully a below, below market price, okay? And then markets the contract to potential buyers, okay? So I explained it earlier already. You know, you find the property, as a wholesaler, you find the property, you put it on a contract, and then you market the property uh, to find an end buyer, okay? The buyer who purchases the contract from the wholesaler typically pays an assignment fee and the transaction is completed without the wholesaler ever owning the property. So again, the wholesaler never actually purchased the property, okay? Can they? Yes, that's a different type of wholesaling, okay? That's called double closing, but you know we're not talking about that today. We're talking about assignments, okay? So the wholesaler, the investor, never actually owned the property, okay? They just own the contract. OK, so they can sell the property without ever owning it. OK, or they can sell the contract without ever owning the property. Right. Uh, let's see. OK, so key players. All right. So who's involved in the in in the deal? Right. The seller, the individual or the entity who owns the property being sold, the original owner. OK, they are the seller. OK, uh, in this deal. OK. The wholesaler, remember, they're the middleman, okay? They're the, the intermediary who negotiates the purchase contract with the seller, the original owner, okay? And then they find the buyer to assign that contract to, okay? And the third person is the end purchaser who buys the contract from the wholesaler and closes the transaction with the seller, Okay. So again, there, there's three parties. There's usually three parties in the wholesale, okay? Seller, a wholesaler, and a buyer, okay? Okay, the benefits of uh, real estate wholesaling. Low capital requirement, okay? So if you want to be a wholesaler, technically you can do it without any money because remember, again, you know, you never have to own that property, all right? Um, there might be things like earnest money that you might have to put up, but if you, you can negotiate that away as well too. So you can negotiate zero earnest money with the seller, okay? 
Uh, but there might be, you know, some requirements, but very, very low. Okay. Uh, wholesalers can enter the real estate market with minimal capital since they don't need to purchase the property themselves. All right. Uh, quick profits. Okay. A uh, wholesaling transaction can be completed relatively quickly, allowing wholesalers to earn profits in a short period. Okay. So again, generally, this is going to be used for distressed properties or properties that need to be sold quickly because that contract is only going to be good for a certain amount of time. Okay. That, that purchase agreement or, okay. Or that sale contract is only be good for like maybe how, whatever many days that you put on there. Okay. So it could be like five, 10, 15, 30 days. Uh, for the closing, right? So you need to you need to find the end buyer and assign it before uh, the original contract expires. Uh, so you, it could be a very fast transaction, and you could you know make you know uh, uh, money very quickly, okay? And you could possibly make a lot of money, okay? Um, the minimal so there's minimal risk, okay? Uh, wholesalers assume minimal risk since they're not responsible for financing or owning the property, okay? Uh, now, there are some risk involved in it depending how you write the contract, okay? The, the original contract between the wholesaler and the original seller, okay? Uh, if you write a good contract, then your risk should be very minimal, okay? But if you write a bad contract, uh, then, you know, you could have some risk. Like you could end up having to buy the contract yourself or the seller may have some kind of recourse against you as the investor, okay? Uh, but generally speaking, there's very little risk um, because you're not the one actually going to get a loan or coming up with the actual money to buy the property itself. It's going to be that end buyer. So the risk to the wholesaler is going to be very minimal, Okay. So challenges and risks, uh, finding the deals, that's, I would say, that's the most challenging thing, okay, is finding the deals, okay? Identifying distressed properties at below market, market prices can be challenging and very, very competitive. That's the hardest part, is finding the deal, okay? Negotiation, negotiation skills, okay, wholesalers need strong negotiation skills to secure uh, favorable purchase contracts with the sellers, okay? So, you need to kind of know your end buyers and what they're looking for, okay? Because if you get a property under contract for like market value, it's going to be hard to turn around and try to sell that contract to an end buyer because that end buyer could just go buy any property at market value. They could just hop on the MLS or on Zillow or whatnot, right? So usually people go to, to wholesalers because wholesalers should be able to get a good deal, okay? And then pass on some of that good deal savings to the end buyer, okay? So you as a wholesaler has should have decent skills of negotiating, okay? Uh, legal compliances, wholesalers must ensure their transactions comply with local real estate laws and regulations to avoid legal issues, okay? Uh, in some states, it's the wild west, so you can do whatever you want because it's all contract law, okay? Uh, some states, they're starting to put more laws around wholesaling, okay? Like, uh, we're licensed in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's passing a law uh, regarding wholesaling, okay? Like, specifically regarding wholesaling, um, saying that they have to uh, uh, let the buyer disclose to the buyer that it's going to be wholesale. But then, you know, generally, if the buyer reads the contract, it will say in there if it's going to be uh, um, uh, assignable or not. Okay, but I guess they just want to make it more noticeable. In other, I know other states they have other laws regarding it too. So whatever, what whatever state you're practicing in, uh, or you're trying to do this in, just make sure you read up on the laws and understand if there is any laws regarding wholesaling. Okay, steps in wholesaling. Okay. Uh, find the deal. We kind of talk about that. Do your research. Find distressed properties. Uh, and you, these are the different ways that you can find them through direct mail, online listings, networking, you know, whatever type of marketing that you like to do. Most type of marketing, if you just apply it to wholesalers, wholesaling, it's the same as trying to find a seller for, you know, if you're a real estate agent and just trying to find a seller to sell a property, it's the same, same steps. Okay. Uh, negotiating contracts. We talked about that already. Um, you want to make sure that uh, you, you know, have the um, necessary contracts to be able to to negotiate and and write up write them up okay including the assignment contract 
and all the languages that needs to go into the, the purchase agreement and the, the contract, okay? Uh, marketing the contract. So having a buyer's list, right? You, you see all those people like on Facebook and you know on the internet saying, hey, uh, I'm looking for buyers, right? Well, you know, generally those are wholesalers. They're trying to build their buyer's lists uh, because wholesaling is great. If you can find the deals, great. If you can negotiate, great. But if you don't have buyers lined up to buy that property within that contract time frame, then you did all that work for nothing, okay? Uh, because you'll you'll find out if you want to be in a, a wholesaler. Uh, the hardest part, uh, well, I would say the second hardest part in wholesaling is finding buyers, like buyers that can actually close. Because everybody will say they're a buyer, but the ones that can actually close, there are very few of those, okay? So you want to go out. I would say even before you, if you're going to be a wholesaler, even before you go out and start looking for properties, I would start looking for qualified buyers, okay, to buy these properties. So investors, like cash investors, investors that have a track record of closing, you know, flips and rental properties and those kind of things. Those are the people that I would be, you know, looking for as a buyer, okay? Uh, sign contracts, okay? So once a buyer is found, found wholesaler assigns the purchase contract, to the buyer for an assignment fee. So make sure you have those uh, assignment contracts. Understand how that uh, assigning uh, assignment works, okay? Closing the transaction, the buyer completes the uh, uh, the purchase with the seller, the wholesaler collects the assignment fee. So again, understand you know the process of, of getting the document signed between the wholesaler and the original owner, and then getting the assignment uh, contract signed between the wholesaler and the end buyer, and then how that ties into getting everything over to the title company and the title company doing all the, the splits, okay? So you wanna make sure that you understand those steps as well, all right? Conclusion, uh, real estate wholesaling offers uh, an accessible entry point into real estate investing with low capital uh, and quick profit, okay? However, success in wholesaling requires uh, diligence, marketing knowledge and effective negotiation skills, okay? So just to recap, wholesaling uh, is basically being a real estate agent without a license, okay? But if you are a real estate agent, you can be a wholesaler as well because again, a wholesaler, they go find a buyer or they, they go find a, sorry, a wholesaler goes and find a seller and then goes and find a buyer and then puts them together you know, to, to get that property sold, right? What does a real estate agent do? A real estate agent goes and finds a seller and finds a buyer and puts them together to get that property sold. Exact same thing, exact same concept. The only difference is the contracts that are used and the language, okay? If you're a wholesaler, you get paid an assignment fee, okay? If you are a real estate agent, you get paid a commission. Exact same thing just call different things and how you get there is just a different process, but they're the exact same thing. Okay. So, all right. With that being said, uh, what are your guys questions? Okay. All right. Let's see here from Jay. Uh, when wholesaling as an agent, what kind of information would we have to disclose to the seller? Okay. So you're, so Jay, I know that you're in Minnesota. So Minnesota, you still have to disclose that you're a real estate agent. Okay. So I would definitely, you know, pop out that, that agency relationship uh, and transaction form and show them and go through that with them. Okay. That's a requirement. Okay. So if you're a licensed real estate agent in Minnesota, then yeah, you're going to have to disclose that you're an agent, you know, show them that agency form. Okay. But beyond that, that's pretty much it. Okay. You can do all the wholesaling that you want. Okay. In other States, again, uh, talk to your broker or, you know, you know, go to your association or the, your, uh, um, your commerce department and ask if there's any, uh, um, disclosure requirements. Okay. Uh, can we use the MLS purchase agreement to wholesale? Uh, yes. So here in Minnesota, okay. Uh, you can, okay. The only difference is the language that you put into the purchase agreement. Okay. In some States, uh, you cannot. Okay. So say, for example, like in Wisconsin, Wisconsin for the, their, their, o, their OTP, their offer to purchase, uh, that is a state specific form, meaning that you can't use any other form. Okay. 
So that one will be a little bit harder, all right, when you're trying to wholesale, okay? But in states where there's no no uh, reg no um, uh, uh, contract requirement, like a standard purchase agreement requirement, then you can just pretty much write in whatever you want. So the language that you put into the purchase agreement, that's going to be the most important thing. But yes, Jay, for you here in Minnesota, you can you can use the our realtor uh, purchase agreement and then just add in the the, the language in there. Okay, uh, Tang. Uh, what happened if the contract expired between the seller and wholesaler without getting the end buyer to buy? So the contract will just be canceled. That's it. Okay. Uh, so if the wholesaler wants to go back and, and try to get a new contract signed, then they can get a new contract signed and then find the buyer and do that process over again. But if the contract expires, then the seller is not obligated to sell anymore. Okay. Um, how is wholesale different from net listing? Okay. So wholesale, it's not that different from net listing, okay? I know some states, uh, net listing is uh, illegal. So you're really going to have to talk to uh, your, uh, uh, if you are an agent, okay, talk to your broker from your state or, you know, talk to an attorney from your state if they allow net listings, okay? Uh, but wholesaling, again, you know, in, in the legal world, there's a lot of different ways to do the same thing, okay? So if it's illegal to do it one way, you might be able to do it a different way, just calling it something different, okay? That's how that's how the rich people do it, okay? So, you know, is it different? Yes, okay? Is it the same? Yes, <laughs> okay. So hopefully uh, that answered your question, uh, Tushal, okay? Uh, do we have any other questions? Now, I know that was very, very uh, quick uh, rundown of two totally different topics. Uh, but again, if you guys have more questions, you guys can always contact me. I am going to uh, put this recording uh, up uh, wherever you found it. So that way you can always have access to it. Uh, but other than that... Um, Wait, we got one more question, right? Before we go, we got one more question and, and I want to answer it for you guys. Uh, can you wholesale a contract for deed? That is a good question, okay? You know, I would say, yeah, you possibly could. It would get very confusing, okay? Uh, but you possibly could. Let's just say, uh, I would say if you, if you, if a person let's just say a buyer buys a property using contract for deed, right? And then that buyer doesn't want to live there anymore, you know? And you as a wholesaler, yeah, potentially uh, you can wholesale that property, okay? Now, whether you do it through the buyer or the original owner of that property that sold it contract for deed, I would say you could probably do it through both too, okay? So it, it's it's going to get very, very confusing if you do it like that, but is it possible? Yes, okay? Um, have I seen it happen? No, I've never seen anybody wholesale a contract for deed before, all right? Uh, so yeah, it's a possibility, okay? But anyways, other than that, thank you guys for, uh, for you know, staying on the uh, uh, call here with me. If you guys have questions, reach out to me directly. Uh, if not, then again, I will see you guys on the next training. Thanks, everybody.